You're doing that with coffee lids. With coffee lids, yeah. So we had, like we had a back pogs. and forth, yes. and yes, yes, give me your <laughs> coffee lid. Cheers. Cheers. You are no stranger to a coffee shop like this. No, nope, been to many coffee shops. Although I drink no coffee with caffeine. What? Yes, a doctor's orders. Uh, so what do you drink, so decaf? It's all decaf. I didn't know anyone was actually out there drinking decaf. No, You're the yeah, guy. No, it's hard to find, yeah. Not only are you drinking lots of coffee, but you are collecting. Why did you start collecting coffee lids? It didn't come about with an idea of collecting anything. I was wandering into a convenience store about 10 or 15 years ago as an architect, and I noticed these very odd designs in these very small common objects. I think I grabbed three or four of them and just threw them in the back of my car, didn't think much of it. And the next convenience store I went to, there were different ones. And I started to think about, like, how many of these are there, actually? So every time I'd stop at a place, I would just happen to grab one, throw it in a box. Then I had 20 or 30. And when I went to grad school, I met someone who is my co-author on here mm -hmm. and found out that they did the same thing. They had their own collection. So we got together at a point and started doing like, uh, you know, trading cards. It's like, do you have this one? Do you have this one? This hysterical, except you're doing that with coffee lids. With coffee lids, yeah. So we had, like we had a back pogs. and forth yes. and yes, yes, <laughs> give me your coffee lids. So we, we put our collections together and it slowly grew to almost 500 lids. We have not found anyone who has a larger collection. Yeah, so we, we're assuming it's, a, it's yes, the largest you're, collection. Yes, you're Guinness lids. World Record worthy. So where is this collection living now? A good portion of the collection is at the Smithsonian in New York, the Smithsonian Museum of American History. So they have a big display on uh, the history of food in the U.S. And so it's uh, it's been there for a few years. Although it's duplicates, it's ones we had more than one of. We weren't giving, willing to give them the originals in the collection. How does that feel to know that something of yours is now living in a place where everyone can spectate and talk about it? I'll get emails occasionally and say, did you know your name was here on this thing in the Smithsonian? I it's mean, interesting. I just have so many questions. What do these coffee lid conversations look like between you and your co-author? Like, what are the details that you guys are drawn to? Part of the book is going into a typology of different types of lids yeah. and all the little functions features of them. The one that's the most common now is this kind of lid, which is has just a big rim. It's got a high hat to hold froth of things like cappuccinos, but there have been many, many steps in getting to that you know, standardization development. We divided it into four typologies. Ah, yes. Let's look at peel, pinch, pucker, and puncture. Do you have a favorite? I do. There's one in there. It's called the Philip lid. Wait, I which section is it? Peel, oh, pinch, pucker, or puncture? Yeah, I think it's in pucker. Okay, well, let me let me right. turn to page pucker. All right, and what is it? So it's called the Philip lid. It was somebody who was clearly obsessed with coming up with a whole new idea. The lid presses down inside the cup and allows a certain amount of coffee out so that you don't have to drink with, with your lips touching plastic. Is there a lid you have like disdain for, like a design flaw you couldn't believe existed? Yeah, the worst ones, and you'll still find them, are the lids that are trying to have it both ways. They're used for hot coffee, and cold drinks, so they have a little crust cut out for the straw to go through, and a drink sip space for the hot coffee, and they don't work well for either one of You're them. You're like, just stop trying to make that yeah. work. Wait, hold the phone. We got colored lids. We do have color. That's a big deal. And we had to fight for a color section in here. So. There's a pink lid. Yes. We gotta find wherever's carrying that. There are chromothermic lids that when they go on hot liquids, they change color. So you can tell the temperature of your coffee by the color of the lid. I'm never gonna look at my coffee lid the same way. <laughs> for every one of these lids, there were hours and hours and hours of research and drawings and things that the people who designed them had to go through to uh, get them patented. So as an architect, how does that correlate to the work that you do? Well, it's all design. It's mm -hmm. all part of, you know, how to take something that you're trying to find a solution to and what kind of form ends up uh, arriving from it. You realize that there isn't one form that follows any function. You find thousands of different variations. It causes you to look more closely at the things around you, you know, the everyday objects that you may not notice. There are thousands of types of toothbrushes, and they're all trying to do the same thing. So it's, it, it really it allows you to look more deeply into, into everyday items. There were some big events in, uh, in the news that changed the way coffee lids look. Um, most people may remember there was in the 90s someone who spilled super hot coffee I into McDonald's that, yeah. and sued um, McDonald's. But when you get into it, it really changed a lot of things about coffee serving. Lids had more graphics on them, caution, and so uh, it's fascinating to track that history through it. And that's what's so cool is that there's history in every object and environment there around is. us. There is. And so it's neat that you brought that story together. 
In terms of your architecture, what are some projects that you've brought to life here in Austin? We do a lot of work at St. Edwards University. We do commercial work for Indeed.com, the new Carpenter Hotel that's about to open, a lot of houses as well. I love sitting there with a new blank piece of paper in front of me. I'm still old school and start with pen and paper, which most people have given up at this point, but. Don't you have to erase things? No, no, no erasing. Pen is serious commitment. <laughs> yeah, it's a, a way of thinking that uh, gets outside of what goes on when you just have a computer in front of you. How has this book been received by different people? Got a lot of press. It got the, you know an article in the New Yorker, in uh, New York Times covered it. Uh, it was pretty shocking, to tell uh -huh. you the truth, that something <laughs> like this. But they explained it in that there's so much bad and heavy news now. They loved covering something like this. I think people are looking for something a little bit lighter. And now I think we've got just a cornucopia of lids to choose from. Right, right. I feel like I need to upgrade mine and we've got cookies, so cheers. Cheers. Thanks, Scott. Thank you.